if my <coughs> projector works today. For starters, I'm not from Georgia. I'm actually from Utah, and I like to start with a little introduction to my family. My wife, you can't really see in this picture here, but she has the prettiest blue eyes you've ever seen. And uh, we've got three little boys, Cade, Clint, and Cole, um, seven, six, and two. So we, uh, she's much more busy than I am, especially when I am on the road teaching salt classes. So when I'm not teaching salt classes or clay classes, I love the outdoors. I keep bees as a hobby. I enjoy canyoneering. Um, Zion National Park is a, an amazing place in Utah. If you ever come out to Utah, let me know and we'll take you into some slot canyons like the one here on the right. When people hear of salt in Utah, the first thing they think of is the Great Salt Lake. And they think, oh, you must be from the Great Salt Lake. A real salt must come from the Great Salt Lake. Well, if you look at the geology in Utah, the Great Salt Lake is the big blue dot near the top. And then the second line down, the pointer won't work, but that second line is where the real salt deposit comes from, which is in the middle of nowhere. And so people will ask, where, you know, how did this salt get there? And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. But just know that the real salt is not from the Great Salt Lake. And if you've ever been to the Great Salt Lake, I probably wouldn't eat much stuff coming out of the Great Salt Lake. Um, it's not the cleanest body of salt water anymore. So, and then uh, towards the bottom, you've got Lake Powell. And, and uh, so the geology in Utah is pretty amazing. And if you ever do come to Utah, these are some pictures of some of that geology that you'll see. And this bottom picture here is done in Zion National Park. And you can see some of the Geology, geologic activities, which is a result of both our salt and our clay. Geologists tell us that eons ago, long time ago, all of Utah was covered in this big body of salt water. And as that salt water evaporated and was later drained, it left this huge body of salt that we now mine from real salt. I wasn't alive back then to confirm it. Some people say it was Jurassic era. I wasn't alive back then. I can't tell you when it was formed, but it was long before the Great Salt Lake. And then the clay deposit, which is volcanic ash from long ago that's weathered over time, is the clay. So you can see all this geologic activity that caused both of these deposits. People wonder, how did Redmond get started? My grandfather started the business back in 58. Uh, Him and his brother started. The family farm wasn't doing all that well, but they knew there was salt underneath their farm based on some Native American activity that had mined the salt long before they owned the property. So they knew there was salt there and the family farm wasn't doing very well. They needed to help you know, raise the kids and so they drilled down, hit the salt, and we've been mining it ever since. So that's kind of the history of the company. And at Redmond we believe, you don't have to read this whole thing if you don't want to, but basically we try to build products and our associates with the belief that deity, nature, had it right with products and people. And that you are the best version of you and somebody trying to change you doesn't really help. And nature had it right with products. You really can't improve on an apple. You really can't improve on wheat. You really can't improve on the way nature created both products and people. And so we try to build our company around that philosophy. I call the salt portion of this presentation natural salts and a mistake of the low salt diet. And the reason is most people now have watched the news or they've read the newspapers and it talks about how salt's the next white poison. It's going to kill all of us if we're not careful. But that's just simply not the case. And so we're going to talk about why that is. First, civilizations, all civilizations, pretty much have been developed around the salt deposits. If you look at almost any culture, they developed in and around these salt deposits, which is interesting because they needed the salt to preserve food. They needed it for, to, sustain, to sustain life. Salt was an essential part. And even if you look at a lot of the early uh, history books and or religious books, salt was an essential part of those books. We talk about as a salt, uh, as a man, uh, salt that, lo that has lost its savor or as a man worth his salt. It's a term based on salary. Even the term salary is derived from the term salt. And so there's a lot of uses of salt all throughout history oftentimes used as in scriptures and used in, in wedding ceremonies and things like that. What most people don't realize is salt was also used to control the war. He who owned the salt deposit generally would win the war, even in the Revolutionary War. If you take out the salt deposits and the military's food starts to spoil because they don't have salt and the, the military 
men and women don't have salt, they can't fight near as effectively, just as, as those electrolyte balances are thrown off. Even the Civil War, the North went around and took out the South salt deposits in the Carolinas, and it made a huge impact on, the, on the, even the Civil War in our time. And many countries, even to this day, will control the salt deposits because they know if push comes to shove, salt is the sustaining of life. Without salt, the, the war of northern aggression. Um, and because of that aggression, they did take out the salt deposits, um, which had an impact. So, um, the salt myth. Salt is one of the most misunderstood minerals on earth. For thousands of years, it sustained life, provided health, was used in all kinds of religious and medical uh, practices, but yet today it's seen as this, this negative thing that's going to eventually kill all of us if we're not off the salt. Without salt, everything starts to die. You need salt to live, which is why if you go to the hospital, the first thing they do is they give you an IV of saline solution, which is salt water. If salt were this thing that's going to kill you, they're not going to put it in an IV, actually anything but salt in an IV. If you had distilled water in an IV, that would be disastrous. If you had tap water in an IV, that would be almost worse because you, you need the this, this saline solution in the salt water. We're going to talk about a few misconceptions in salt. The first is salt is salt. As you'll see here today, that is simply not the case. There is many different types of salt, kinds of salt, uses of salt, and the idea that salt is salt is salt, just wipe that right out of your vocabulary. Some people, because they've heard that salt is bad for us, how many people have heard that sea salt is better? A few of you? Yeah, most people have. Again, throw that out with the bathwater. That is completely not the case. Maybe 30 or 40 years ago, that was the case. Today, as you'll see here in a minute, sea salt is generally not better than what you may consider table salt. You may have heard the term kosher salt. A lot of chefs in, in cooking shows call for kosher salt. We'll just cover that right now. Kosher has two meanings when you talk about salt. The first is kosher means approved for the Jewish community. And there are some foods that are considered by the Jewish law of health okay to eat and others not. And so if an item is kosher certified, it means a rabbi has approved the process. He doesn't really bless the salt. He just approves the process to make sure it's clean. A little bit like the state health inspector that might come through to make sure you're following certain health standards. There's a, a Jewish process that's the same. So if you see the chef on TV calling for kosher salt, generally that chef isn't meaning salt for that's approved for the Jewish community unless it's a Jewish cooking show. When he's saying kosher salt, what he means is a larger crystal. I'm going to pass this shaker around and you can see that this one that says kosher in the name is a lot chunkier salt. And a chunkier salt works better for certain applications. For instance, if you've got a prime rib, you want to suck the juice up out onto the outside of the top of that prime rib. So the, the, the recipe might call to roll that prime rib in some kosher salt. And kosher salt will draw the moisture out more efficiently than a fine salt without making the meat too salty. So when the chef calls for kosher salt, know that's the size of the crystal that they we're talking about. Uh, for pretzels, it's nice. Or for some loaves of bread, you can pull the bread hot out of the oven put the butter across the top and then sprinkle some kosher on it. Kind of gives it a nice little crunch and uh, a fun thing to do with like a loaf of bread or a pretzel, which is the kosher size crystal. You can do the same thing with the coarse, which is here in the store, and you get a grinder and then you can just grind a little bit of salt on the top. Just select the size of crystal that you want. So when you see kosher, realize that if it says a little symbol on the back or the front with an OU or a circle K or something like that. It means approved for the Jewish community, which our salt is. But in most applications, if it says kosher, you want something that says kosher on the front and is a bit chunkier crystal. Do you mind coming up and passing those around for me? Okay. You also may have heard of gray salt. Gray salt is typically a salt that comes from a current ocean. We'll show you some examples of that. One of the types of gray salt you hear is Florida cell. We'll talk about what Florida cell is and, and where to use that. Terms you may have also heard rock salt, which is just the, kind of defines the size of the chunk. Rock salt's typically more of a, a larger chunk of salt. You can have rock salt that comes from a current ocean, from an ancient seabed. Other terms you'll hear crystal salt, which is basically uh, typically they're talking, if they say crystal salt, they typically mean real salt or the Himalayan salt that comes out of the Pakistan. Other terms you hear, red salt, black salt, pink salt, typically those are produced 
in uh, the, I'll, I'll show you how those are produced a little bit later on. So a little bit of chemistry, and then we'll get into some more fun stuff. Just I, I don't want to bore you too much with the chemistry, but we learned in grade school that our body is about 72% water. So if I'm 150 pounds and I have 72% water, it means the rest of me is about 108, 108 pounds of water and 42 pounds of mineral. Outside of a spiritual discussion, that's really all I am, is water and minerals. And because of that, that's why salt is so important, and having the right kind of salt is so important. A Nobel Prize winner once said that you can track every ailment, every disease to a lack of minerals, which is important to us today because most of our soils are depleted much more than they used to be even 100 or 200 years ago. If you look at wheat from 100, 200 years ago and wheat today, Unfortunately, the wheat today, depending on if it's organic and the soils it came out of, is much more deprived of its nutrients. Natural salts, whether it's coming from a current ocean, an ancient seabed, a dead sea, have all of the minerals that our bodies need in the right proportions, which is kind of interesting. Our bodies are, are literally saline solution in motion, which is why we get that saline in the hospital. Now, because of that, it's important to realize that water without minerals doesn't conduct electricity very well. And if I were to, to fall over here on the floor with a, a heart attack or something, and, and hopefully somebody calls the paramedics and they come running in here, what they're going to try to do is reestablish my electric current. Because outside, again, of a spiritual discussion, the only difference in me here living and talking and me laying on the floor dead is the absence of an electric current outside of the spiritual side. And so because of that, we need these minerals. We need to be able to conduct electricity. So I've got a light bulb here, and I haven't plugged it in yet. And I've got two wires that are sitting in a pool of water. And then it's coming to a light bulb. So if this water were a great conductor of electricity, when I plug this in, it's going to blow up. No, just kidding. When I plug this in, that light bulb should turn on if this water in this bowl were a great conductor of electricity. However, you can see the light bulb isn't turned on. And that's because distilled water and even tap water that has been removed of the minerals do not conduct electricity. This is why the Florida Gators created the product Gatorade, because these, the athletes were out there working out in the hot Florida sun, and they were starting to pass out because of the loss of these electrolytes. So they created a drink with electrolytes and salt, because as you add electrolytes, then your body begins to conduct electricity. And so if you are walking around mineral deficient, and you're not getting enough minerals in your diet, and you're not getting enough minerals other places, and even if you're drinking all the water in the world, you're going to be flushing minerals and not adding minerals, which is why when you go to the hospital, they give you an IV of saline solution, not an IV of tap water or distilled water, because you need those minerals to conduct electricity, because your mind communicates with the body through an electric current. That's, how, that's why the EMTs come in and try to get your electric current back into balance, into normal. I'm going to plug that off so we don't have the EMTs coming when I stick my finger over there and it gets really exciting. So without, it, so, uh, without salt and minerals, the body won't conduct electricity. If you look at an IV bag, this is just one example. There's a couple of different standard IV bags you might use in a, in a hospital setting. This in here is called Lager Solution, but you can see for each 100 milliliters, it contains sodium and chloride, which we know, um, 600 milligrams of it. But it also has calcium chloride, potassium chloride, these other electrolytes that will help balance out that sodium. In nature, you, you have all these other minerals that help balance out that sodium. In nature, seawater doesn't occur, occur as pure sodium and chloride. There is sodium and chloride in it, but there's also potassium chloride, magnesium chloride, calcium chloride, very much like if you go to the, the, the supermarket or the health food store and you buy a supplement of vitamin C, oftentimes you, if you look that over, that vitamin C is going to be pure ascorbic acid. Now, if you look at vitamin C in nature, vitamin C in nature is not pure ascorbic acid. Vitamin C is a complex, and ascorbic acid is one part of that vitamin C, which is why most people agree that eating a bunch of oranges is going to be a lot healthier, and you'll get more use out of the vitamin C than you would taking a vitamin C tablet. Same thing with beta carotene. If you look at vitamin A in a carrot, it's a complex. It looks like this. And beta carotene is one sliver of that vitamin A complex. You can overdose on beta carotene supplements, but you have a tough time overdosing on carrots 
because the carrot is in a form that the body recognizes, the body can process and digest. Salt's the same way. If you look at salt in the ocean, it looks like this. There's sodium chloride, potassium chloride, magnesium chloride, calcium, all of these different minerals. If you strip all those out and you're left with pure sodium and chloride, your body's going to have a tougher time processing that product, which causes several different problems. Now, I'm not going to go through all of this information with you, and I don't expect you to read all of it, but these next few slides just talk about some of the things that salt does for the body. There's a lot of things that salt does for the body and why we need salt for the body. Um, the one that most people, this uh, second one down, essential for prevention of muscle cramps, restless leg syndrome. If anybody struggles with restless legs, one of the best things to do is right before you go to bed, take a quarter teaspoon of salt, put it under your tongue, drink a big glass of water, and you're not going to kick whoever's next to you in the bed that night. We've actually had a couple people come up and tell us that it's actually saved their marriage because they've uh, not had to go through that kicking anymore. So we actually sell it in a capsule now. I, I don't think I've even presented it to, to Sue yet, our little capsule, salt capsules. Um, but it's for that reason. So it, it's, it's essential for the cells. It hydrates the cells. It's vital for the absorption of food, which is why all of our animals, uh, you know, if you have... If, you have a couple of cows are going to be much better off if they have access to a good, clean, natural salt. We have a, there's a doctor named David Brownstein. He's an MD in Wisconsin. He's in the Midwest, and he uses salt almost exclusively for asthma. If any of his patients are having asthma, now this isn't like fast-acting inhaler asthma. What he will do if they start to have that wheezy asthma, he'll take a quarter teaspoon of salt, put it in a glass of water, put it under their tongue, and have them drink it. It helps um, clear up the congestion in the lungs. And uh, this isn't me talking. Again, this is Dr. David Brownstein. He's got a book called Salt, Your Way to Health. Uh, it's referenced in our, in our material here. You'll get it at the end. You can pick up a copy of his book. Um, so it's essential for all of, all of these things. This is some medical quotes. This is a natural doctor. When sodium is lacking in the body, there's all kinds of problems that take place. Um, this is one of my favorites, Dr. Robert Thompson. He's another MD. He says, what if I told you that I have a formula that would eliminate more than 50%, if not all, birth defects? And he goes on and talks about how that is salt that's going to do that, the natural kind of salt. Unrefined salt is synonymous with birth defects, miscarriage, organ failure, premature aging, and death at a young age. And yet this is the same salt we're talking about that's going to kill all of us. So um, he has found that in his practice, most people are salt deficient not having too much salt. The Dr. David Brownstein, he's the book, the, the author, the medical doctor who wrote the book, Salt Your Way to Health, he says in his practice, um, he's also found that medical research shows that you have a 430% increase in myocardial infarction, which is heart attacks, for those that are eating the least amount of salt versus those eating the most amount of salt. Um, and he goes on about how low salt diets are deleterious to the body. Sodium. Um, I, I don't have time to go through all these, so I'm just going to bounce through a few of them. This is one from a doctor called Dr. Batman Gelly. He wrote a book called Your Body's Many Cries for Water. And he says a salt-free diet is utterly stupid. And so they say, okay, these are all these doctors, but give me some medical research. Show me some American Journal of Medicine. So this is a study in the American Journal of Medicine. You probably can't see that if you're further back than me. But uh, the second paragraph here on the left says, adjusting for calories and all previously mentioned cardiovascular disease risk factors, a sodium intake of less than 2,300 milligrams, which is your daily recommended allowance, was associated with a 37% increase of cardiovascular disease mortality and a 28% increase in all-cause mortality. Meaning, again, if you're eating less, the least amount of salt you eat, the more chances are you'll have health problems earlier on. And this is why American Journal of Clinical Nutrition did a follow-up study to American Journal of Medicine and said, why is, why is this the case? And what they found was that, um, again, you can't read it, but you'll just have to trust me here. It says that uh, what they found was that you could have individuals could fall into the highest blood pressure groups or the lowest blood pressure groups, depending on as far as the highest amount of salt intake or the lowest amount of salt intake. And they would be highest blood pressure or lowest blood pressure based on if they were eating adequate amounts of calcium, potassium, and magnesium, which are these other electrolytes that naturally occur in salt but have been removed in most of the salts on the market today. So that's how salt became the health destroyer. The invention of the refrigerator were uh, late 1800s. Before then, most of us in this room, probably all of us in this room, would have eaten more salt then than we do today. The reason for that is because most of the food we would have eaten would have been preserved in salt. 
our meats, our kimchi, our sauerkrauts, our pickles, everything would have been preserved in salt, so our salt and consumption would have been much higher than it is today. Yet back then, we didn't have near the amounts of high blood pressure, water retention, um, all these negative aspects of salt that we see today. Well, what happened about the same time when the refrigerator was invented, salt companies also realized that in the salt, in seawater, in the, even in the ocean water, there's all these other complex chlorides, things like potassium chloride, magnesium chloride, calcium chloride. And these other chlorides could be pulled out of the salt, out of the seawater, and sold to other industries. You could take out the magnesium and sell it to people that was put on roads to, to, for ice melt. You could take out the potassium, sell it to some chemical companies. You could take out these other minerals, and what you're left with is pure sodium and chloride. Even if there's a few other small minerals in that, by taking out those big three, the calcium, potassium, magnesium, it makes it much harder for the body to process the remaining salt. A good analogy in a, in a bread setting would be white flour and wheat, and wheat flour. And if you, if you had grown up and you saw white flour your entire life, the first time you saw some wheat flour or you ground your own wheat, you'd look at that and say, wow, what are all the dirty pieces in here? This, this flour's gone bad. And uh, yet salt's the same way. If you look at natural salt, it shouldn't be stark white and free flowing. Uh, it, any more than, than your flour should be stark white and enriched if you go with the, you know, back to nature. Not only is salt a problem because of the lack of the trace minerals that we have, which I've just talked about. It, years ago, and the way they still produce some of the gray salts you'll see today, is they have a big evaporation pond where they'll pull the water in from the ocean, let it sit in that pond. And as the salt water sits there, the, the salt will start falling out of suspension onto the bottom of the pond. Well, by using a series of ponds, if you bring the seawater in, you can bring it into the first pond. You can pull out maybe the magnesium chloride. Then you move the water to the next pond, pull out the calcium chloride, move the water to the next pond. So through a series of evaporation ponds, they're able to manipulate and take out different minerals that you have in nature if you let salt occur like it's always occurred in the past. That's a problem, which we just talked about. Even more so, or just as problematic, is all the additives that are in most of our salts today. This is just a short list of the approved additives in your salts. You can see things... Uh, sodium bicarbonate, that's baking soda. You know, that's not a, a real problem. But you get to some of these, like the fourth one down or the third one down, you'll see this yellow preciate of soda, which is also known as anti-caking E535. Both of those anti-caking agents are really sodium ferrous cyanide, which is sodium, iron, and cyanide. And if you take that into the body, yes, yeah, small amounts probably aren't going to be a problem. But if you take a large amounts of that over a long period of time, that's not going to be great for the body if you can avoid it. Same thing with the sodium silico aluminate. That's the aluminum that they link to some of the um, aluminum deposits that occur in the body that end up causing problems later on. And again, a small dose isn't going to be a problem, but over time, all of these additives will start to accumulate. Um, this uh, polyethylene glycol, which is the third one from the bottom, that's one carbon atom away from antifreeze. Um, polyethylene glycol, that's stuff you see sometimes on Dateline and, uh, you know, somebody's gotten into some antifreeze for some reason, but that's what that is. So these, this here is the material safety data sheet off the, some of the chemicals we just looked at. Um, and the ones I want to point out, this yellow pressure of soda, you probably can't read it, but it says it's extremely hazardous in case of ingestion. Repeated or prolonged exposure can produce target organ damage. And so a lot of these additives are not things we want to be taking on a daily basis. Sodium silico aluminate, um, it says here, it says repeated exposure to a highly uh, toxic material may produce deterioration by accumulation in one or many human organs. This is the aluminum deposits that people link to Alzheimer's and all kinds of stuff. So um, potassium iodide is interesting. This is hazardous in case of ingestion, but if you look at the bottom, it says repeated, um, let's see, oh, it's second from the bottom. This substance may be toxic to the thyroid. But yet it's added, uh, potassium iodide is added to salt, started to be added back in the 20s to get iodine in people's diets, which was important because most people are iodine deficient. But salt is, and a chemical version of iodine is not the best way to get iodine. Eat more, you know, natural foods and you'd be able to get a lot of that iodine. Seaweed, kelp, fish, avocados, eggs are all rich in iodine. And then finally you've got things like dextrose. We used to say just a spoonful of sugar helps the bad salt go down. The reason dextrose is in most of the salts I'm going to show you isn't because of the bitterness, and they're not trying to mask that. What they're trying to do is stabilize some of the other chemicals. Uh, dextrose is a great stabilizer, so by putting that in the salt itself, it'll help the other 
additives in the salt not turn yellow and look funny over time. So I wanted to show you a few pictures of some salt products. Now, I'm not trying to poke fun at any of these brands, but just to give you a feel for what the back of a shaker looks like. And I'd encourage you to, to you know, take your salt that you're using at home, or any product for that matter, and look at what the ingredients are and just kind of practice you know, checking out the labels. And you will might find some things that will surprise you. The first few salts I'm going to show you are salt substitutes. Typically, they're um, recommended for people or people think they're to be used for those that are maybe salt sensitive or they're on you know, high blood pressure issues like that. What's interesting, if you look at the label of any of these salt substitutes, you're going to see a warning in bold. It says, for normal, healthy people. Um, please consult your general practitioner before use. But yet, this is supposed to be the stuff for sick people. And so it's just unfortunate. Because of the chemicals in there, it can cause more problems to the heart than your regular, even your processed table salts. So you'll see ones like this. Again, the red says, for normal, healthy people. Please consult your general practitioner before use. If you're receiving treatment for diabetes, kidney, or heart disorders, please consult your general practitioner before use. But these are the salts that people turn to thinking salt's bad, but what, unfortunately they're going to salts that are worse than they would have had if they would have just stuck with their processed table salt that they grew up with. Um, so things like tricalcium phosphate, uh, sodium silico aluminate, and you'd expect some of these salts here that you've grown up with to have some of these chemicals in. And all the salt that it's talking about is the demineralized salt. They've already taken out the potassium, the magnesium. So you not only do you have the lack of minerals in the product, but you also have the extra problem with some of these other additives that are added to it. But you'd kind of expect that with some of these more table salts. The difference is when you switch over to sea salt, people think, oh, I'm, if you see two products on the shelf and you see this one and maybe the previous one, most people might think, oh, the sea salt one's going to be better. Unfortunately, the salt to start with is both the same demineralized salt almost 80, 90 percent of the time. Plus, in this case, you've got yellow pressure of soda, which is sodium ferrocyanide that you didn't have in the previous one. So this is actually a worse additive than the one we looked at before. So we move over to this one. You can still see it's got a list of chemicals. This is actually has one more chemical than the big blue jar that you maybe grew up with. This has five in it. The one that you made, the big blue one, has four in it. So this has more chemicals and it's a sea salt than the processed table salt that most of the U.S. uses. Then you'll see ones like this, another, it's another sea salt that looks great. And then on the back, it has this mysterious anti-caking E535, which if you look that up on the internet or in the library, that is sodium ferrocyanide. Nobody wants to put that on their label, so they can call it E535, even though that's exactly what it is. Um, you'll see some like this. Now, this has no additives. It just has refined sea salt, which means it probably doesn't have as many minerals. It's been maybe run through this process, but at least there's no additives. So I would start this one well before some of those other ones we've looked at. And then this one here, you might not be able to see this. Again, there's no chemicals in it. It's a really good product. But if you read the back label pretty close, it says, the seawater is transferred through a series of evaporation ponds, which successfully eliminates these other elements. So you're starting out with a great product, and they're taking out the potassium, taking out the magnesium, and then what you're left with is 100% salt, which is true, but you're missing those, those minerals, those electrolytes. It's like you know, the difference in a vitamin C versus an orange. So how do you find a natural salt? Now, obviously, I like Redmond brand, and uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that. But I also want to show you other, three other great brands that I think are good brands to start with. So if you don't use ours, and uh, for whatever reason, then make sure you find one of these other good brands. And so I'll, I'll show you kind of what questions to ask that will lead you to our brand or maybe, maybe another brand on the market. First is know the source. Know who's producing it. Today, mo most of our products are coming from the same few producers. And oftentimes, even if you buy a different brand, maybe they're still buying it on the open market from that producer. So know who's producing it, not just the brand, but you know, do some research, find out you know, where is your product actually coming from. If it's coming from a current ocean, find out where that current ocean is, because that'll make a big difference. If you want your sea salt from a current ocean to be coming from the Gulf of Mexico, the San Francisco Bay, or maybe a bit further out, I mean, all of those things play into effect. So know the process, know what's been taken out of it, has anything been removed from the salt, and then find out what's been put back into it. Is there any, if there's been anything that's taken out or anything that's put back in and you can find one that hasn't had either of those, that's probably going to be a lot better off. And then knowing the source, knowing exactly where, exactly where that salt's coming from. So I have a couple of favorite brands in addition to Redmond. And the first one is the Celtic salt. It's a gray salt. You may have seen that in some stores. It has a light gray color to it. 
the way they produce the gray salts, if you look here at the top left, you've got a gentleman out there, seawater occurs at about 2% sodium and chloride. So if you just went out to the coast, build a big mason jar full of salt, you'd end up when that water all evaporates with about 2% of that weight of that initial jar in salt. And what happens, seawater can only, or water can only hold 26% salt. So if you put this salt in a mason jar and let it sit there, the salt's not gonna all dissolve because the water can't hold any more than 26% of its volume in salt water. So what happens is when that seawater comes in from the ocean and the sun starts to evaporate off that water, when the water hits 26% sodium and chloride, then a percentage of it will fall to the bottom of the pond. So a guy goes out there, stands in the pond with a rake, and he rakes up that salt off the bottom of the pond. And that bottom of the pond, it generally has a gray clay in the bottom of that pond. So you get not only the minerals from the salt, but you get a little bit of the minerals from the clay into that gray salt, which is the way salt's been produced since the dawn of time. And so there's the Celtic brand, which I really like. I think it's a great brand. There's also some other brands of Celtic, um, of gray salts. One of the challenges is that it's a little bit more expensive because generally it's coming from overseas. So it's going to be more expensive here for us here. Now you also may have seen this Florida cell. It's very expensive where if you're paying gray salt, maybe 70 cents an ounce, you'll pay up to 350 or even $4 an ounce for the gray, this Florida cell, which is kind of a, a flower of the ocean. And if you look at that Florida cell, what happens in this picture on the top right, if you have seawater that's right about 26% sodium and chloride, if you, we took a mason jar and filled it with salt water, and then we took a hair dryer and we took that hair dryer across the top of that salt water, you're going to get this film that kind of flash crystallizes across the top of that jar. That film is your Florida cell. It's a very light, like a snowflake salt crystal, and it's very expensive. And he's raking the top, that little film, off the top of that seawater, and that's where the Florida cell comes from. The problem is it's not very effective to have a hair dryer out there, so they have to wait for the wind to hit the pond just right which is why it's so much more expensive. Generally, if you're putting Florida cell into, into a product, into breads, into soups, it's not worth the $4 an ounce. Where this might come into play would be if you're doing maybe some salt caramels or some, something fun that you get this light crystal on the top of the product. Maybe would, would be worth you know, paying that extra uh, four times the amount. Another one is Hawaiian salt. If you're ever in Hawaii, this is a great salt to pick up. Generally, you only get it in Hawaii. It's made the same way as the Celtic. They take a current ocean, they pull the water in off the coast of Hawaii. It's not near as polluted as maybe some of the other parts of the world. So they pull this salt water off, they evaporate it into a pond, and that pond has a, it's lined with red clay instead of gray clay. So you get this nice red hue to the product. Hawaiian tastes a lot more like ours than many salt, a lot more like the real salt, than, other than it has a little bit of a dusty flavor to it from the light uh, gray red clay that they use there in Hawaii. The product that's most like ours is the Himalayan. Many of you may have heard uh, about Himalayan salt or pink salt as it's sometimes called. The Himalayan salt all comes from Pakistan. There's about 17 mines in Pakistan that produce the Himalayan salt, which is why it's so much more expensive. Generally, it's quite a bit more expensive because you've brought it in from Pakistan. And you'll also see pricing pretty dramatically different and that depends on some of the salt that's coming from those countries are fair trade certified meaning that somebody's gone in and certified that they're using fair labor practices and it's produced in a sustainable way others not so much and so you'll see this big price variation from 60 cents an ounce up to $1.20 an ounce just based on on how they're producing the product in Pakistan of course my favorite is is real salt as I mentioned before real salt was produced or is produced uh, in a underground mine in Utah and it's underground underneath my grandfather's farm and you can see here in this picture in the center the strata in the mine runs vertically which is very unusual in in a sedimentary deposit when you look at uh, the way seawater would be laid down it would be laid down like this book you know layer upon layer upon layer under heat and pressure somehow that deposit has been pushed up like this and so that deposit sits vertically and so you can see the vertical lines in the mine a question we get sometimes is, are you ever going to run out of salt? And uh, the deposit itself, it looks pretty much like that. It's about a quarter mile wide, three miles long, and core drilling shows it's about 5,000 feet deep in this pillar. And at 5,000 feet deep, it turns and goes this way. Now mining, sometimes I say, we're, we are down about 300 feet in that 5,000 foot deposit. And I've been, you know, since 1950. And so we're, we're just barely scratching the surface. If you've never been underground, 300 feet sounds like a long way. 
in mining, 300 feet is, is just not even the surface yet. So we have a lot of salt. You can make a lot of loaves of bread, and uh, we still wouldn't be out of salt. If you're ever in Utah, please come by. This, the pictures of the rock crystals, I meant to bring some rock crystals, and uh, we just crush those up. The entire refining process at Redmond is we take the salt that comes out of the ground in rock crystal form, like you see here, and we crush it up. That's the entire process. And we leave it just the way nature created it. Now, I have got a short little video clip, and uh, maybe I'll hold off and show that. If you'd like to see, it's about a four minute clip, and it shows some of the process in the mine, um, how we extract, it takes you down underground. Kind of a fun little video. If you'd like to see that, come up afterwards, and we can sit around my laptop and watch it. The sound probably wouldn't carry through the entire room very well. Some of you may have noticed that our labels have changed. We had a lot of customers call us and say, hey, are, is, did Redmond sell? Are you guys a different company? Because they saw this recent change in our shakers. Maybe some of you that have been in the store for a while have noticed that change. We just put this up just so you could see that we are the same company. We do have occasional label changes since the 70s when we came up with the idea of calling it real salt as opposed to just salt that came out of Redmond. Um, so it's kind of fun to see how it's changed over the years. So we're just going to skip this video. Um, a few questions people have. First off, what's the difference in, in real salt than what I'm currently using? Well, that really depends on what you're currently using. So go home, pull out your, your cupboard, look at the salt that you're using, and see how it is different. See if, you know, look at, for the additives, look for the lack of minerals, and then look for the taste difference. Most people notice right away just tasting it side by side is a huge difference. So for everybody that came today, I've got a uh, a little salt booklet. This booklet will kind of go over everything that I talked about today in short form. So if you're trying to remember some, you know, story or something, it's probably in here. And for years, we've had people that, uh, you know, this little two-ounce shaker that's uh, available for sale for a couple of dollars here in the store. People love to take that with them to restaurants because once you get hooked on our on our salt, it's hard to switch back. But the problem with that shaker there, it's very hard to pack with you. It kind of leaks in your purse. It's too big for your front pocket. So now we have our chapstick tube size. So everybody that came today, feel free to grab one of these on your way out for your purse. Um, we might even have two apiece, so you can take one for a friend, and a couple of salt booklets. And does it taste better? Most people say yes. Nine out of ten people say real salt tastes much better than any other product they've ever used in the past because of the lack of the, those bitter chemicals and because of the trace minerals that give it a very sweet, natural flavor that doesn't give you that burn in the back of your throat. And I've got some salt up here, we can do a taste test with you if you still need some convincing at the end. Some people say, why is it so expensive? You know, I've looked at uh, my salt, my, my cheap salt that I've gotten for years, and I look at this one in the store, and it sells for $5.39. You know, why is this in so much more than the other one? Well, the real reason for that is many things. Mostly, many of the big salt companies, you can make your money selling those other minerals. You can take out the potassium, sell those, take out the magnesium, sell those, take out the calcium, sell those. And then what you're left with is kind of this byproduct that can be sold much less expensively than a natural salt, which is why, although we're the least expensive of all the brands I showed you, your Himalayan, your Celtic, your Hawaiian, we're less expensive than those because those are all coming, they're natural salts, but they're coming from overseas. But if you look at the traditional salts, then, then the natural salts are going to be much more expensive. Is it good for my health? I'm not a doctor and I can't make that claim, but most doctors would say yes. We've actually got a few doctor quotes in our little salt booklet here. They'll talk about why salt is essential for health. And any doctor that tells you that salt's bad for you, then ask them why you get an IV of saline solution. And it may cause them to think a little bit and, and start you know, doing the math there. Can I get too much of it? Most of your natural doctors and uh, your even doctors that agree with the salt philosophy is no, you can't. You really can't overdose on an IV. You could have an IV hooked up for quite a while, and unless you, you need to, maybe you need to have a catheter, but you're not going to overdose on an IV because your body's going to balance itself with that salt as long as you have the fluids to balance that out for the most cases. Why is it dirty? It's really not dirty, just no more than wheat flour is dirty. And is there iodine in it? Yes, there is. Real salt has naturally occurring iodine, about 10% of your daily recommended allowance per quarter teaspoon. However, what's interesting is even your iodized salt, only 10% of the iodine and iodized salt is bioavailable for most people. So even though you're getting about 50% of your daily recommended allowance per quarter teaspoon of iodized salt, you're only getting 10% of that that's really bioavailable, that your body can actually absorb and not just pass through. And a question we get oftentimes, can I use it if I'm on a low-salt diet? 
Again, we can't make medical claims, but most doctors say yes. And actually, many doctors actually recommend us by brand because of its ability to, to balance out the body, help with restless legs. Dr. Brownstein uses it, again, for asthma and things like that. So if there's no really big questions on salt. Now we can talk about the fun stuff because clay, as, as much as I'm excited about salt and how essential it is for health, we say if you don't listen for yourself, listen for your kids and your grandkids because we don't believe anybody should have children on their property or even adults on their property unless they've got some clay handy. And, and we'll talk about why that is. Any quick questions? Need a drink of water before we get rolling? Because this, this is the fun stuff. So you can see by my pictures here that clay has been used in many cultures throughout the world for many different things. Starting here on the top left, we've got a, a lady here eating clay. She just pulled the clay off a, a deposit there. The one in the middle, they're making a clay cake. In many cultures, they actually eat clay on a daily basis, and she's making little clay cakes to take with people throughout the day. Um, this is a close-up of those clay cakes. We also see clay used in every spa pretty much in the world for body wraps, for facials. And then this here on the far uh, bottom right is a picture of a clay pack or a poultice. So we're going to talk about all the ways to use clay. And when I say clay, when, when I say salt, I mean natural salt. So when I say you can't get too much salt, you can't get too much natural salt. And when I say clay, I don't mean just any old potter's clay or clay off the maybe the playground. I'm talking about a specific type of clay. And that type of clay is a bentonite, montmorillonite, living type clay. We'll talk more about how to find that type of clay. So native cultures have used clay since the dawn of time. If you go to almost any culture, I, I don't know, I say almost any, because I don't know of any that don't, but there might be some somewhere. But almost every culture that we know of has used clay for many different things. They've used it for topical as well as internal applications. Native American people called clay Iwaki, which means mud that heals. So even in our country here, not only in, in South America and Europe and Asia and Africa have they used clay. Even our native uh, people in this country have used clay. Even animals have used clay, which is why they think people started using clay in the first place. If you... Um, some people may have, there's a, discover, there's a show on Discovery Channel every now and again. And it talks about this group of parrots that eat clay. Has anybody seen that? Um, you'll have to watch for it. It's on usually like a Nova station. We'll talk a little bit more about that. But birds eat clay, dogs eat clay, horses eat clay, cows eat clay, and people eat clay. And they roll in the mud as well. And if an elephant gets hurt in the jungle, it doesn't run to the vet typically. It runs to the mud. And as it rolls in the mud, that mud dries. And just like that mud is going to draw out maybe a blackhead on your nose when you go to the spa. It's going to do the same thing for that thorn or that bee sting. And the elephants know that. All of these animals have used clay, and which is why they think many people started using clay themselves. The way we started eating clay, well, there was a book. We, we, so we had the salt deposit there, and we also had this little clay deposit there on my grandfather's farm. And we used the clay mostly for industrial purposes, as well as the occasional bee sting or spa, you know, would use it for a facial. But we would never think about eating clay at the time. This was, you know, back in the 60s and 70s. Well, there was a book called Our Earth, Our Cure. It was written by a French naturopath, homeopath named Raymond Dextreet. This book was translated into English in the early 70s. And we had this group of, of uh, at the time we thought they were kind of health food nuts. They walked into the office and said, hey, we've done some research in geology. We believe your clay is going to be this same uh, makeup of this healing clay that we'd like to buy. And we'd say, great, we'll sell you clay. What do you want to use it for? A facial, uh, uh, you know, to line a golf course pond? What do you want to use it? And they said, well, we'd really like to just eat it. And, and we said, excuse me, what, would you, what did you want to use the clay for? And they said, no, we'd like to eat it. And uh, after we got off the floor from laughing, um, we said, you know, our clay, you know, we learned in, in kindergarten, you don't eat dirt. And so this clay is not, is not to be eaten. This is an external, uh, you know, this is for industrial purposes. And they said, no, we, we, we've, done the, we've done our homework. Your clay is clay we want to eat. So we said, okay, we'll send it to a lab. And if the lab says it's okay to eat, not going to kill anybody, then we'll sell it to you. So we sent it to the lab. The lab came back and said, you know what, this, your type of clay we call inert. It's, it's not going to hurt anybody. It's definitely not going to help anybody. It's just dirt. And so we put it in a little jar and said, OK, you health food crazies. We'll sell you this little jar of dirt. We're not going to recommend you eat it because that's weird. But you can buy it if you'd like to. So they bought it. They came back a few months later, bought some more, came back a few months later, bought some more. And at the time, we thought, these guys are just off their rockers. And none of, none of us would consider eating dirt. Um, 
but they did give us a copy of the book, and we read the book, and this French homeopath says that the right kind of clay will do everything. It'll work on diarrhea, constipation, colitis, diverticulitis, Crohn's. I mean, the list just goes on and on and on that this French nut says clay will do. And we didn't, we didn't believe one of them. And this is in the mid-70s, this, uh, one of the ladies in the office, she was expecting one of her, one of the, I think this was her uh, fourth or fifth child, or third child, and, uh, and she was on iron supplements. And one of the things with iron supplements, generally it causes constipation. And she hadn't had a bowel movement in, in many days and was getting you know, very uncomfortable and the doctors were getting very nervous and they wanted to prescribe some pretty heavy diuretics and things like that to see if they could get things moving along. And she didn't want to do that. She was worried about the health of her baby. And, and her husband said, you know what, this is weird, but there's a book that says that, right, this, that our clay, if you eat it, it's going to solve constipation. And they both thought that was crazy, but they, um, she said, you know what, I'll give it a try at this point, but if I die, you're coming with me. And so she said, if I'll drink the clay, but you have to drink some too. So they took two glasses of, of, uh, of water, just like the French guy says in his book. He says, take two glasses of water, or a glass of water, put a teaspoon of clay powder in the glass, mix it up, and just drink it. Actually, he says, let it sit overnight and then drink it. So they took two glasses, they filled it full of water, put a teaspoon of clay in each one, mixed it up, sat it in the fridge. The next morning they went out and they both took a drink. And then he went to work and she stayed home. And uh, she calls later that afternoon and says, hey, I don't know what, what, what happened, but uh, we're, we're back in business. And so they, they all kind of laughed about it and said, you know what, the 200 things the French guy said would work, he guessed one of them right. But who couldn't? I mean, if, you've, if you say Clay's going to do 200 things, how could you be wrong on, on all 200 of them? And so from then on, whenever somebody had a problem with constipation, they would, they would go to the clay because it seemed to work great. And that's all I used it for. Well, another couple of years down the road, somebody else in the office was having the other problem and uh, just had diarrhea so bad, they were just, just terrible. And they said, well, the French guy says it would work and they tried all these other ways and nothing had helped. And so the, as a last resort, they went to clay and they mixed it up two glasses of water again. Probably the spouse didn't want to die. And so they mixed up two glasses of water and uh, drank them just the next morning. And then by the mid-afternoon, everything was was back to normal. And they said, well, the, of the 200 things, he guessed two of them right. Well, over time, clay became the first thing to go to instead of this last resort. And lo and behold, the French guy who wrote this book wasn't quite as crazy as we all thought he was back in the day. So since that first book, now there's a lot of books on clay. You can't walk into a Barnes & Noble and not find one of these books on clay. Because clay, eating clay, although it was crazy weird back in the 60s and 70s, now it's just a little bit weird. And so it's because of all these books now that are on clay. Because of that, now there's a lot of different pro clay products on the market because people are becoming more aware of clay. Years ago, you could only find one or two clays, and now you can find clays all over. This is where our clay comes from. It's coming from right from the same deposit. Geo again, geologists say you've got this big uh, inland sea that the salt was remnants of. This volcanoes like maybe Yellowstone or uh, Fish Lake volcanoes are going off and covers this area with this volcanic ash. And this volcanic ash, as it weathers, looks like this. And that's what the clay looks like in its raw form. And we just crush it up. We don't heat it. We don't bleach it. We don't do anything to it. We just crush it up. Years ago, we sold the clay pretty much just like this. We'd sell you the clay jar. It's about $10 for a jar. Um, we'd sell you a couple of books on clay on how to use it, and that's pretty much how we'd sell it for. And at the time, we really didn't know why clay worked. We couldn't tell you the chemistry of it. We, didn't, we just said, you know what? We don't know why it works, but you're welcome to try it. That's kind of how we sold it. Now we know a lot more about the chemistry behind clay. We know that it's very alkaline. Uh, which is great for upset stomachs and indigestion and things like that because of the alkalinity, which is the opposite of acid. Have you ever noticed how a Tums or Rolaids a Pepto tastes kind of chalky or like clay? There's a reason for that. <clears throat> so at the time, we sold it just like this. We found over the years, though, people really didn't know how to use this because if you say this jar is going to work for 200 things, half the audience believes you're crazy, and the other half thinks there's no way that's going to work. So what we've done over time is we've taken the clay and put it in different uh, tubes and packages to make it easier for people to use. But the best way to buy it is still in this 10-ounce jar. Even though we've got some, some fun products up here, I don't think these are in the store yet, but this is really your best value right here. And that'll sell. What do you, you know, how do you sell that for? Okay, that's, uh, we recommend 10, so they get a penny discount if you buy it here. <laughs> um, 
So the clay works internally. We're going to talk about internal reasons clay works, and we'll talk about external clay reasons that clay work, and I'll show you a few pictures, and then we'll, we'll wrap up. So there's really four reasons that clay works internally. Okay, this is why you would want to consume clay. The first is pH. pH is potential of hydrogen, or how alkaline versus acid. If you remember back in chemistry class, zero is acid, 14 is alkaline, and seven is neutral. Anything above seven is, is alkaline or basic, which is and anything below seven is acidic. Most of us today, unfortunately, walk around very acidic because of our, our diets. If you eat a lot of, of processed foods and sugars and stuff like that, you'll probably be a little bit over acid. When you have acid issues, you're going to have all kinds of stomach and bowel problems because of that excess acidity. So clay, having a pH, the right kind of clay, having a pH between 8, 7, and 9, 8 is very alkaline, which is why it, all of a sudden it makes sense. You know, Dextry back in the when he wrote his book and when it was translated in English in the 70s, he talks about how clay works for acid indigestion and heartburn, acid reflux, uh, uh, hiatal hernias and things like that. Well, those are all typically acid issues. And if you can counteract that over acid with something that's very alkaline, that, it makes sense why that's going to work. So that's the first thing is the pH, the alkalinity. The second thing is cation exchange capacity. Now, you don't have to remember that big word. All I remember is that clay is really strong, this type of clay is very strong negatively charged. If something is very negatively charged, it's going to bind positively charged stuff to it. A lot of your books on clay talk about the power of clay as a detox program. If you look at a lot of your health food products, if you ever bought a colon cleanse or a liver cleanse, chances are clay was a big part of that cleanse. The reason that is is because clay will bind those positively charged toxins, free radicals, pesticides, herbicides, uh, heavy metals that are positively charged to the clay, and it helps it pull it out of the system which is why you see clay as a part of that detox program. If you've ever tried to make your own wine, that's actually clay is used in, in distilling wine because you make the wine, you put the clay on top, and the clay binds the toxins to it, and you throw that away, and then you've got this, the wine left over. So clay has been used uh, industrially as well as medically for removal of toxins. Uh, activated charcoal, anybody familiar with activated charcoal for like stomach gas and things like that? The reason activated charcoal works, actually EMTs, I'm a, an EMT on the side, EMTs will carry activated charcoal with them on the ambulance rig. The reason they carry activated charcoal is because its ability to bind stuff to it. So if you have somebody that's overdosed on some pharmaceutical, you don't want that pharmaceutical to enter the bloodstream. So by taking activated charcoal, that activated charcoal will bind the pharmaceutical so it can go out the right way instead of getting absorbed into the blood, which is why activated charcoal is typically used. And the reason that that is is because of its ability to bind stuff to it, because of its cation exchange capacity and its surface area to surface tension ratio. Basically, it's like a sponge, so it, it draws stuff into it. Clay works the very same way. And then finally, it's rich in minerals. We talked in our other presentation how mineral, most of us, unfortunately, in this room are mineral deficient. We're not getting enough minerals in our food, and our, min uh, our food is demineralized. Well taking a clay, which is rich in over 60 minerals, really helps build that back up. So it's this four-prong approach on why Dextreet, who didn't really know why clay worked, he just knew it did, this is why it works. Now, there might be some other synergistic things that happen in the body that we are not aware of, but we know that this is the case because of the chemistry. So when people talk about clay, the first reason they take clay is typically for uh, acid issues because of the pH. And so if you have an upset stomach, the way Dextreet would say to take clay is to take a glass of water So he would say, Dexter would say to take a, a teaspoon of clay, put it in a glass of water and let it sit overnight. And then you just drink it the next morning. Let's see if I can find a spoon here. Now, some of you might think that looks a little gross, kind of chalky, milky water. And next, you would say to leave that, let it sit overnight, and then the next morning, you just drink the whole thing. And as that sits, you'll start to see some settling occur. And so that's how we took clay all the time initially. But the problem with that is that some people, my mother being one of them, do not like the idea of drinking muddy water. No matter how good it is for you, it's just muddy, it's still muddy water. So we actually have a, a We've actually put it in capsules for you, so it's a little bit easier to take than muddy water. Now, 
I actually like the taste of it, and many people actually do because it's not, afterwards we'll let everybody tim and drink some, and it's not as weird as you might think. And I find that drinking it, it provides a whole lot really faster than a few couple of capsules, probably because it's, it's already broken out. But if you can't get past that, you can put it into your own capsules, which is the cheapest way to go. Buy the 10 ounce jar, put it in your own capsules. Or um, the bread breakers can order you some, some uh, capsules in, a, in special for you. So that's the first reason to take it would be the alkalinity issues. The second thing, you now this would be very hard to see, is the cation exchange capacity. This is just a sh the red circles, which you can't see from where you're sitting, is the, the cation exchange capacity test results. And the first one that you can't see is this is, it's 25, and then the next one is 57, the next one is 75. These are just different brands of clay that we've tested. And of all the brands we've tested, we have the highest cation exchange capacity, which is the highest negative charge. So when you're looking for clays, whether it's our clay or somebody else's clay, the th questions you want to ask, one, what's the pH? What's the cation exchange capacity? Um, because both of those things, the higher the number, the better the clay is going to work for you. And then because of those reasons, typical internal uses, and I've got these in a book. Don't have to write, write all these down. But this is some of the stuff that, the, that Raymond Dextreet, that initial crazy clay person, said that clay would do. When we looked at this list back in the 70s and laughed our heads off, now we don't laugh quite as much because we've found that, that he's right on, on all of these. Um, food poisoning it works great. Again, it binds toxins to it, just like the activated charcoal would, but it's more alkaline, so you get the stomach acid knocked down. You, you draw the toxins into it, and then you also have the 60-plus trace minerals. So those are just a few of the, the ways. Now, how to use clay. Dextry, the first book, would say to mix it up like that, let it sit overnight, and after it sits overnight, you just drink it the next morning. And it, pays, it just basically tastes like water. It might be a little chalky, but there's really no, you're kind of like, ugh. There's really no flavor. And once you come up and try it at the end, you'll see that I'm not just filling you full of it. So the way to make clay is typically to make it this way. That's how Dextreet said to do it. So for the first many years, that's how he took clay. We just did exactly what Dextreet said and mixed it up just like that. Well, a few years into this, my grandfather, but we also used clay externally a lot. And at the time, my grandfather had a, a jar of clay, which is, this is just a jar of prehydrated clay mixed up for a burn or a facial. We keep this in the kitchen at all times. Ever burn yourself on a pan or a, a bee sting, it's always great to have some wet clay around. So he had this clay just like this in his kitchen cupboard. And he woke up, as he was getting older, he uh, ate too late in the evening and got up at probably 1 o'clock in the morning and had this heartburn issue going on. And he thought, well, if I mix this clay up, like Dextreet says, let it sit here overnight so it can be completely hydrated, I'm going to be up all night anyway. But he remembered that in his kitchen he had this pre-mixed stuff that had been sitting in water for a month or so, just ready for the next burn or bee sting or, or kids' uh, skin knee or something like that. And he said, well, this, this clay has been in water for months. It should be just fine. And he knew that clay, a teaspoon of clay powder, swells to about a tablespoon of clay gel. So he took a, a spoon, got his cupboard out, took a, about a tablespoon of the clay gel, put it in the glass of water, and then mixed it up. And he thought, well, if nothing else, I've tried. And he goes back to bed. He wakes up the next morning, and it, it solved the problem. So he runs into the office. Stop the press. Stop the press. There's a new way to take clay. You don't have to let it sit overnight. Just if you've got the wet clay mixed up, just use the wet clay. So when I grew up as a kid, that's how I always had clay. If I ever had a tummy ache as a kid, my dad would just grab the wet clay, just put it right in the jar, mix it up, and let me drink, drink it right away. And it always worked. So for years, those were the two ways we took clay. This is probably in the 80s now, and, and clay for us wasn't weird at all. It was actually part of everyday life. And a person walked into the office, and she had been to Egypt and had gotten sick and went into the pharmacy, and the pharmacy in Egypt told her to take clay, gave her some clay. She gets back to the States, and she can't find any clay. She finds us in the phone book, drives down, and says, I'm, I'm here to buy some clay. And we said, great. You know, it works wonderful. We didn't laugh at her because we, we'd used it ourselves at that point. And uh, we said, how do you take it? And she says, no, we said, we said, how do you take it? Do you let it sit overnight, or do you use the gel? And she looked at us and said, what are you talking about? And he said, well, the book says you've either got to let it sit overnight, or you've got to use it prehydrated. And she says, you guys are nuts. In Egypt, we just mix it up in a glass of water, drink it, and we're done. And so then there was a third way to take clay. So the more we've learned about clay, we realize that there's not really, it's more of an art than it is a science. It doesn't have to be done just like this, and to experiment and try what works best for you. And so from then on, we had three ways to take clay. Mixing it up, letting it sing overnight, which is how some people still do it. Using the gel, which is how I do it most of the time. Or 
putting it in, just mixing it up and drinking it, or taking the capsule. So that's going to be four ways to take it internally now. Now, Dextreet would say that you can just let this sit. And as it sits there, if you're in the front row, you might be able to see you've got some clay sitting across the bottom as it's kind of started to fall out of suspension. Dextreet, the original guy, says just drink till it starts to get a little bit thicker and then stop there and, and you'll be, that's all you need to do. Because of what I know about clay and the minerals in clay, I don't want to lose any little teeny drop of clay. So I'll just keep mixing that up. And if I don't get every bit in the first, in the first glass, I will put more water in, mix it up, and get every little granule out of it that I can because I'm looking for those minerals and that cation exchange that, that maybe you get some, obviously you get some of that in the clear water off the top, but personally I like to get every, every last drop. There's also capsules, which is a, um, an option as well. So we've done clay for years, and my grandfather, after he had kind of retired from the business, decided to do some missionary work down in Guatemala. So we'd go down there and, and spend some time building wells and teaching school and trying to get people to start businesses and things like that. Because he'd used clay his whole life, he's down to Guatemala, and there's all this problem with dysentery and, and uh, health issues and food poisoning because they don't have some of the health uh, laws that we have here. And so he became kind of known as the mission doctor, although he had no medical background at all. But if anybody had any issues, whether it was somebody from the states coming down or one of the locals, they'd come to him for clay. Well, the people that uh, had kind of organized this mission said, hey, you know, Milo is my grandfather's name. Milo, you can't just be giving dirt to people to eat. Um, if we ever, you know, if the government finds out, this could shut down the whole, the whole mission because you're practicing medicine down here giving people dirt. And uh, so they said, you need to get some type of medical study to be able to, to do this. So he went to a university um, in Utah and said, can you, we know that clay works for dysentery, I mean, for, for diarrhea and things like that. So can you do some medical testing and prove that this can work so I can keep giving it out in, in Guatemala? And they said, okay, for, for, for this to work, for clay to really help with dysentery, which is the leading cause of, of death in the world for children because they get sick and then they get dysentery and, and they don't make it back because of the loss of electrolytes. They said two things. First, your clay is going to have to be, uh, have to have the ability to bind toxins to it. And my grandfather said, yeah, we, we know it does that. And they said, well, we need to create a study to show that. So they looked at cholera and aflatoxin B, which are two highly you know, mutating toxins. They said, if the clay can bind those toxins to it, then you've got the first problem solved. Once you do that, then it, your clay will also have to be the world's perfect electrolyte. Because when you've got dysentery, you lose all these electrolytes, and you need that clay not only to solve the bacteria problem or the toxin problem, but it also has to rebuild the body's electrolyte balance. The World Health Organization has what they call the optimal solution for rehydration therapy. This is this uh, liquid solution, kind of like Pedialyte that they take or they administer to help rebuild the electrolytes. The very top line is this world is the World Health Organization's optimal solution for rehydration therapy. And they look at sodium, potassium, chloride, and glucose in that solution, but they're really just looking at potassium and sodium because the chloride is attached to those and the glucose is to make it palatable, sweet enough to be able to keep down. So if you look at the World Health Organization, it says 90-20. If you look at rehydrolyte, which is like a pharmaceutical grade Pedialyte, you have 75-20. Pedialyte comes in at 45-20. Resol comes in at 50-20. Risolite comes in at 50-25. Gatorade shouldn't even be on the list. Um, it's 25 and less than 1. And then you have Redmond Clay, which is, I say magically, or um, just interestingly, is 90-25. So earth, the way it was created by deity, by nature, how it was it ended up on my grandfather's farm, occurs in the exact ratio as the World Health Organization's optimal solution for rehydration therapy. Again, it's hard to improve on nature. It's hard to improve on a carrot. It's hard to improve on you because you were created to be the best you you are and don't try to be somebody else. And I think products are created the same way. So what they found was that Indeed, um, our study concluded on Redmond Clay's actions against the aflo uh, mycotoxin, aflatoxin B, and the esoteric toxin cholera was successful. In solution, Redmond Clay effectively binds these toxins. Um, we propose this action may make Redmond Clay an effective antidiarrheal against secretory diarrhea. Its biochemical makeup leads it to an effective oral rehydration solution as well. Now, this was a medical study in petri dishes. In order to take this in and do a, an actual medical medical study, you know, it cost, cost hundreds of millions of dollars, which is why clay, none of the clay companies can afford to do that because we sell a jar of clay for $10, and you've got a lot of teaspoons of clay in there, a hundred and some actually, and you just can't, for, 100, for $10 a jar, 
you can't recoup the cost of a hundred, you know, several hundred million dollar medical study. So you probably will never see that. So that's why we take clay to internally. Now I'll end the last few minutes on how it works externally. Again, every spa in the world, every diva since Cleopatra has used clay on her face. And the reason for that, if you go into a spa and you get this nice clay pack, who's had clay packs? Anybody have? You, can, you kind of feel your face getting tight and it kind of pulls and it kind of feels really cool and afterwards it feels really clean. Well, the reason that happens is because clay does really two things topically. And a third thing that I believe does it, but it's, you don't have really the science behind it. So I think we'll talk about those. So the first thing that clay does topically, um, actually let's shift gears and talk about how to use clay topically. Clay can be can used several ways. It comes in a powder form. And you can keep it in a powder form. I have clay in my house in a powder form and in the hydrated form all the time. As a powder, it's great for, the, for a body powder. Redmond clay, in its natural state, is more absorptive than talc or cornstarch. And so for a body powder, for baby's powder, you'd have the sorest diaper rash you've ever seen. And one diaper change later, that Redmond clay will pull that heat right out. Just like it heals the face, does the same thing for baby's little bottom. And the, the, the clay wicks the moisture away. And it also soothes, just like it would soothe the, the spot on your face. It does the same thing for baby's bottom. And so it works great for that way. So I keep it as a powder for my kids. It's also great in baths. If, you've ever, if you're starting to feel kind of achy or feel a cold coming on, take a quarter cup of clay and a quarter cup or half a cup of salt and put it in a bathtub and soak in it. And that clay and that salt will just help release all those sore muscles, achy muscles. If you kind of feel that fluish cold coming on, do that a couple of times, and it makes a huge difference in the, in the duration of the cold. Um, clay is also used as a poultice or a compact, as well as for facials. And I'll talk a little bit about a clay burrito. Actually, I'll talk about that right now. So one of the mistakes people make when they use clay topically is they think it's a poultice, or it's, a, it's an ointment. So they see the clay, and they'll take a little bit of clay and, and try to rub it in like that. Well, clay doesn't work like that. Clay, you want it nice and thick. When an elephant goes to roll in the mud, it gets it packed on nice and thick. So I'm going to show you some burn pictures in a minute. And if you use nothing else for Edmund Clay, using it for burns in the kitchen is, is amazing. And if I have a big burn here on my forearm, I'll show you a picture one later. And it's a, a nice big hot burn. And with a burn, bacteria love freshly burned skin. They'll start to migrate over towards that burn, which is why if this were a serious burn, I was in a burn unit, every 24 hours they would do something called debreeding or deculturing. And they would take a nylon brush and scrape that burn to get rid of that bacteria. It's, it's, it's a miserable, uh, hellish pr practice. But they have to do that to get the bacteria off. Well, clay naturally binds the bacteria to it. Clay also draws more blood to the surface, which helps that heal. So if I had a big burn here, what I'd want to do, according to Dextreet and uh, Cleopatra and everybody since then, is to put a clay nice and thick all over that burn. And I'm looking for about a half inch to uh, a quarter to a half inch thick. And what's fun about clay is clay, even at room temperature, afterwards, if you come up and I put some clay on your arm, um, this is very cold. So it feels really good on a burn because even at room temperature, clay feels cold to the skin. For instance, uh, getting in a 68 degrees doesn't feel all that cold unless you're sitting in a bathtub at 68 degrees and it feels ice cold. Same thing with clay. So even the clay at, at 70 degrees or 68 degrees or 71 degrees, feels very cold and it touches the skin. So if I put that on there, what happens is that clay is now drawing stuff into it. It's pulling out the heat, drawing out the heat into it. It's also keeping any bacteria off. It's also keeping the air off. You know, sometimes when you have a burn, when it's open to the air, it hurts really bad because it's throbbing in the air. So if you cover that and keep the oxygen off, it's going to feel a whole lot better. So it's doing the two things I talk about clay doing mostly topically. First off, it, it draws out the infection or draws out the, the thing, whether it's the blackhead on your nose, the, the bee sting. So that's the first thing that clay does. The second thing clay does is the longer it sits there, it in, as it's drawing and pulling, it's increasing the circulation, which is why if you've ever had a facial, when you wash that facial off, chances are your, fa your face was red for 10 or 15 minutes afterwards, kind of blotchy red because it's actually pulled so hard that it's drawn the capillaries to the surface. Now the other thing is harder to document as far as the the science behind it, but by keeping that clay on there, my body knows that clay's there, and so my body itself, some people call it body talk, or, or the body knows how to heal. By putting that clay on there, it's drawing it, my body is drawing, drawing attention to that area. So not only do I get increased circulation and the drawing out of the, 
whatever it is that's causing the problem. My body is also subconsciously kind of focusing on that area. The thing is, I don't want to walk around the house with that on there, or I'm going to slop it all over everything if I go to the store. So what we've done, in Dextry's book, he talks about using a piece of cheesecloth and uh, covering it with a piece of cheesecloth. But in, in our day, I found that a piece of saran wrap works much better and much cleaner than a piece of cheesecloth. So if my boys skin their knee or something like that, I'll just put a big clay pack on there, wrap it in saran wrap, and they can go to bed and sleep with that nice clay pack on there all night and not get it all over the house, the sheets. I can actually put that on and go to work like that. I can put it under my long sleeve shirt if I didn't want people to say, what in the world? Um, or I could just leave it open like that, and I can go around all day long without getting that clay all over everything. So that's the first way to use clay. Now the clay burrito, we've had uh, over the years, we've had issues with clay that are really hard to, to wrap like that. If you have, maybe, maybe you've got a, an eye issue, maybe you've got a sty that really hurts, maybe you've got an earache that you'd like to pack it with clay, sometimes it's not very convenient to use clay in some of those areas. So what we've come up with, we call it our clay burrito, and you take a piece of cheesecloth, about like that, and kind of lay it out there, depending on the size. Then you just take your hydrated clay, which you should all have mixed up, ready to go. And for my kids' ear aches, this works very well. The first time I used a clay burrito like this, I'd actually, you guys know what potato cannons are in these parts? So I made a potato can when I was about 16, and I was the neatest kid on the whole block. A potato cannon, for those that don't know, basically you have a piece of PVC pipe about yay long with a larger PVC pipe at the bottom. You spray some hairspray or some ether or some starting fluid in the back, hit it with a little igniter off the back, and that potato will launch you know, a couple hundred yards. Well, I'd made one of these, and we'd been shooting it all afternoon. My mom hated the thing, and I brought it back into the house, and I learned an important lesson on incomplete combustion. And I had this potato can in my basement. It was on a Saturday. And I had, I had a little, you know, on, the, on your barbecue grill, that little red button you can kind of push to make the spark. I installed one of those in the back of this potato cannon so I could just hit that button and create a spark and it would launch. Well, I had shot it earlier in the day. I'd brought this thing in my basement, sat it there on my bed. I'd been doing some Saturday chores, came in and thought, I wonder if my sparker's working. Now, it had been shot several hours before. Little did I know that after you shoot something like that, the fumes can rebuild back up in the chamber. So I held it to my eye, looked down like this, and I hit that starter button. And like slow motion, I could see this flame kind of just boiling up out of that barrel. And uh, luckily, I got my eye closed about like that. And uh, just as it hit and it burned off, my eye, actually, eyebrows were gone. Most of the hair on the side of my head was gone. And it singed my eye shut, um, kind of just the, the eyelashes had curled back and kind of stirred it shut, and so it really hurt. My face was kind of like, so I went over to the mirror and kind of pulled my eye open, and all I could see was this great big white ball, and my mom was in the next room vacuuming, and I thought I was going to be dead, so I snuck out and ran into the bathroom and hurried and kind of washed my hair, what was left of it, and, and my dad came downstairs and said, hey, shut the vacuum off, you're burning the belt or something, and, and so I walked in and said, no, that's actually me, and my mom turned around and she screamed, because I'm not, you don't appreciate how much an eyebrow and your hair adds to your face until it's not there. And uh, so anyway, I had this big bright ball and, and we hadn't had anything like that before, but Dextreets talks about how you can you know, pack clay in your eyes for all kinds of things. So we took a piece of cheesecloth, long story, sorry about that. Take that piece of cheesecloth and then you've got a clay burrito. And then you can pack that on, it's nice and cool, you can pack it on over an eye. Uh, over an ear. It's great for ear aches. You can use that almost anywhere. You can watch TV without getting clay all over the place because it's self-contained in this little clay burrito. So we've used these all the time now. So we used to say just keep your jar and your saran wrap. Make sure you have some cheesecloth handy because it's just so nice to have for special application sites. Um, so typical ways to use clay, we've heard everything from burns, which is probably the most common, burns, bee sting, spider bites, poison ivy, poison oak, works great for any of those, um, which is very common. We also hear things um, such as uh, uh, shingles. We've heard many shingle stories. The thing with shingles we've found is if you've had shingles for three days, there's, this is, there's only been two cases where this hasn't worked. If you've had shingles for two days, if you pack them, if you, you know, pack it on, wrap it in saran wrap, wherever those are, for two days, they're gone. If you've had it for one day and you get the clay out within the next day, usually one day later, they're gone. 
three days, three days, four days, four days. So as long as that person has had shingles, they pretty much have to use the clay that same amount of time. In the last 30 years, there's been two cases where that hasn't worked. We're not really sure why. There's a lot of reasons why people can have different ailments, and for whatever reason, for those two people, that, that didn't work. It did feel good, did provide some relief, because it felt good, but the clay didn't solve the problem. So, uh, when we'll talk a little bit more about each of these sites. So, to prepare the wet clay, the best way to make that is to buy the 10-ounce jar uh, for about $10, and then have a mason jar handy. The best way I've found to mix this up is to find a high grade funnel. I've got one right here, it's all right. <laughs> You're fast. Thank you. Uh, question on the burn. Uh, with a fresh burn, if the burn is still hot, the, as soon as that clay warms up, I would take the clay off and put new clay on. Because you don't want to trap the heat into that burn. Now, if it's an older burn and it doesn't still have that hot sensation, then I would leave it on as long as the clay feels good. Typically, what people would do if that were a big burn there is I would pack it on, leave it the clay on overnight, and then the next morning I'd just rinse it off in the shower, then I'd pack it on the next day. And then usually by then, your body knows, hey, if this is feeling good, I'll leave it on. If it's a real serious burn, it might take three or four days. If it's a, a minor burn, it may just take just one time. But you'll be able to feel you know, if you want the clay left on there. The thing with the clay, on a burn, you don't want to let it, it dry. If you had something like a bee sting or a spider bite, you could pack that on. Your early books on clay say the clay is smart, and the clay will fall off when it's done as much good as it can do, and then you can put more clay on. And I think with burn, with like a bee sting or a spider bite, I will do that. Or if my kids are playing outside and they've got stung, we'll just pack the clay on, a, on the spot. You know, if they got stung by a bee, I'd put it on maybe the size of a quarter or a big silver dollar and pack, pack the spot and let them set, just send them right back out uncovered. And then as the clay dries, it'll just draw and pull and then fall off, and then they'll come put more on. But for a burn, you always want to leave it covered. You don't want to ever let it dry on a burn or it really, really hurts. So take your, take your quart mason jar, uh, or curd jar, or whatever jar you have, and a 10 ounce clay will perfectly make one quart of mud. So if you take that, dump that in there, and then fill, your, fill this jar twice. Now the first time you fill it, you're gonna say, how in the world am I gonna get my second jar of water in there? But the clay shakes down very good. So you put it in there, shake it up, and then like magic you have room for your second jar of water. I recommend the best water you can find. Whether that's like your ionized water back here, whether that's spring water, um, if you've got tap water, great. If you have a filter, I think it's better. So I always say the cleanest natural water you can find. I use ionized water at my house, but I think spring water works great or filtered water. Um, I'd rather not use tap water if it's got a lot of other stuff in it, just because you don't know how it's going to. Now, I don't know if you can hear that. It's very runny. If you let that just sit overnight, just like that, the next morning it'll look like that. So all I've done is just one jar of powder, two cups or two, two jars of water. So one to two. Let it sit overnight, and you'll get that every time. And then you just leave that in your cupboard. It's not going to go bad. It's just clay and water. The worst case scenario, it dries out over time. And so you just add a little more water. Get a little more water to it. It'll just rehydrate itself. So I leave that in my cupboard all year long. I've got a friend who does a lot of time in the kitchen, and she uh, burns herself, maybe more than some of us do, and so she keeps hers in the fridge, because although it feels great at room temperature, if you're using it most of the time on burns, having that in the fridge, you get cold times a lot more. So that's how she stores hers, is in the fridge. I've had tubes like this that have been in a, under the seat of my pickup for years, and never used them, and I'll pull them out years later when I'm out to my beehives or up fishing with my boys, when I get stung by a bee or they walk through a stinging nettle bush or anything like that. So I always try to have clay 
available. Your first book on clay talks about how it should be stored in an earthen jar. He defines earthen as wood, ceramic, glass, something like that. Over the years, that's how I've always tried to store it. But now for convenience, we also have it in a couple of plastic tubes. If you're going to store it in plastic, just make sure it's good, clean, uh, virgin plastic. If the plastic is, has held other chemicals or things in the past, that clay could actually leach out some of those chemicals from the plastic. So we always say store it that way. How to hydrate it? I like just the cleanest natural spring water I can find. Storage, it stores great either wet or dry. The thing is with a jar like this, if you're using a regular mason jar and you've got the, like the uh, metal canning lid, it will rust that metal canning lid about like that. So when I use a canning jar, which is what I usually use, is I will take a piece of saran wrap and put it over the top, and then I'll put my canning lid on, just so the clay isn't on, always touching that metal or it'll rust your... The other thing is not to use a metal spoon or store a metal spoon in the clay, because it'll do the same thing to the spoon, just because of the way the clay interacts with, with um, drying stuff out. It'll help with that, speed up that oxidization process. So a few pictures and then we're done. Um, one thing I want to talk about, though, before is with a one of the great ways to mix up clay t if you're going to be drinking it along. We'll just shift gears again. <laughs> oh, there we go. Um, a teaspoon, a teaspoon of clay in a glass of water is about the same if you calculate it out to a quarter cup of clay in a pitcher. So for those people that are drinking a lot of clay on a daily basis because they've got some stomach ailment they're working on, one of the very common testimonials we get is for uh, diverticulitis and, and colitis and things like that. If you're taking clay for that or a, or a hiatal hernia, that, you know, going through a lot of clay, it's kind of a pain to be mixing up a glass at a time all the day long because what they'll typically do is take a, um, a glass all day long. They'll just drink clay water. So one of the best ways to do that is take a, a gallon pitcher and put a quarter cup in the gallon pitcher and then sit that in your fridge and then all day long you've got clay that's mixed up it's ready to go it's always just right there and at the end we'll bring some of these cups over here so everybody can take a glass of the clay water so here we're just going to finish with about a half a dozen pitchers or maybe a dozen pitchers this is these are just testimonials we've gotten over the years this first one is a sunburn this was a, a, a young gal she had blonde as they come she was working her first summer out of college as a flagger for the Department of Transportation and she stood out like this for about 12 hours that first summer day and just came back with second degree burns on her arms from the sun and you really can't see very well but maybe if you look at the picture on the left you can see those blisters um, on the left picture on the lower arm from the from the sunburn so they just pack it on nice and thick they wrapped it in cheesecloth actually and then sprayed it with some water to keep it nice and wet that's how they chose to do it and then they wrote us in and said this is the first time I've ever had a tan and uh, just turned to a nice brown color instead of that hot color. This was on our Facebook site. Uh, Lindsay wrote us and said, I needed some clay. To, let's see, I used some clay today as a poultice for some pretty painful burns I got on my hands. I was amazed. Nothing was relieving the pain, so I decided to give it a try and instant relief. Seriously, um, it was shocking how instant it was. After soaking uh, for a few hours, uh, the burns are still tender, but they don't hurt at all. I'm so thankful I discovered this clay. We hear this all the time for burns. This is the last burn I'll show you. This was a gentleman who took a settling torch across his forearm. He was working at a machine shop and somehow turned and just took his torch right across his forearm. It looked just like that, other than it was the other arm, I suppose. Um, and instant third degree burns, blistered, you know, yucky burns. He went to the hospital and they gave him some ointments and creams and sent him home and said, there's nothing we can do about it. And uh, his neighbor had used some clay before, so they came and got some clay and packed it on and then four days later he came back in and it's back to pink skin and again if you, clay for a burn you want to keep the bacteria off because bacteria love freshly burned skin and if you get increased circulation that new clay that the new blood that's coming in is going to help heal that burn from the inside out now all of us have different uh, body chemistries and different circulation issues so everybody's going to be a little bit different but it's pretty amazing that this guy's able to go back to almost normal in just four days uh, this one is really hard to see. This is a road rash picture. This was, um, there's a store up in Illinois called Fruitful Yield, and the store owner had attended one of these clay classes. She went home, she made herself a jar of clay, and the next morning, just serendipitously, her son was riding his bike, and a car came and kind of swiped 
a little bit close to him. He fell over on his bike and just um, covered his arm in, in uh, road rash, you know, full of rocks and debris and all kinds of stuff. And so she said, wait, 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 wait. And she wouldn't let, him, wouldn't let him even clean it off. She just grabbed the clay and packed it on there, wrapped it up. And uh, I'm sorry, you can't see the pictures very good. On my computer, they show up a lot better. But it just lifted out the rocks and everything right out of his arm, just like it lifts out the black kid out of your nose. It's the same thing for the road rash stuck in your arm. And the next day, he's pretty much back to normal. This is a little bit um, worst case of road rash. This was a gentleman who was riding a, on a cycling race, a 100-mile bike race, um, went down about 25 miles an hour and just filled his leg clear full of rocks and debris and, and all kinds of stuff. The race doctor said, if you don't stop racing right now and get this professionally cleaned, you're going to be tattooed for life because you're going to have all those rocks and that garbage stuck in your leg. Well, he finishes the race and he calls me and he says, hey, you gave me some clay. It was a friend of mine. I gave him some clay years ago and never tried it. He hadn't even mixed it up. It was in his cupboard the entire time. He calls me and said, hey, you told me I could use clay for a road rash. Well, I've got a, into an accident, and my, road, my leg's pretty messed up. And I said, well, first take a picture. So he took this picture, and then he mixed up the clay, just like you know, we did today, packed it on there. He laid on the, in front of the TV on a sheet. His family wasn't home at the time, and uh, let that clay dry. As the clay dried, he just jumped in the shower and just washed it off. He didn't scrub it. He just, whatever clay stayed on, stayed on, whatever washed off, washed off. And he took this picture a couple hours later. You can't see in this picture, there's actually two rocks you can still see left in this picture. They've been pulled out since then um, with his second round of clay. This was a gasoline burn. This was a lady, a 78-year-old woman, who uh, cut her ankle out in her sprinkler field. And she has poor circulation anyway. And so over several months, it became gangrenous. The picture on the far left, you can see the gangrene. It was moving up her leg. You can see it's approaching her knee, and they couldn't get ahead of this infection. They tried steroids and creams and antibiotics. They couldn't get rid of it. And so they were talking about amputating at her knee. Her daughter had used clay for a brand new clue spider bite, and it worked wonderful. So her daughter suggested she try some clay. Well, she packed it on just like this. They put a bread bag up over her foot and just packed it on. And they did that for several nights, right in a row. And even in the first month, they were able to get the whole gangrene pulled out. And then two months later, she still had some circulation issues, but it totally, totally drew all that drew that out. This is my most disgusting picture. This was a gentleman who had a big. This is a, a guy's bag, and this is about right there on his back. It's about a size of a silver dollar, about a half inch deep. He had some skin cancer that was removed. After it was removed, it wouldn't heal, and so he had this big gaping hole in his back. He just couldn't get rid of it. So uh, they packed it on, and, and two weeks later, they sent us this picture, which is the one in the middle, and the big infection ring's gone. The yellow pussy stuff's been pulled out, and it's actually filled in. And then a month after that, they sent us the final picture. And their biggest uh, raving thing about the clay was the pain relief, because it was able to get the, the pain, the air off, get the bacteria out, and the pain relief was the biggest thing. Not only did it heal it, but there was the pain relief that they ranted and raved about when they sent us the pictures. This was a major back surgery, same thing when they took the adhesive bandage off and just kind of hamburgered his back. For 16 days, he tried numerous treatments. He went to the hospital, stayed overnight there because of the pain. The neighbor had heard about the clay, took him a jar of clay to try. They packed it on. And he wrote us and said, in the first time in 16 days, I could sleep. And then uh, within two weeks, it was totally healed. I'll end with this one. This is the very last one. Um, in some of the early books on clay, it talks about how to use it for broken bones. And now I'm not sure as far as how that goes. Maybe it increases the circulation. This uh, kid was playing baseball. He was a high school. He was a junior year of high school. He was playing baseball. And he was the shortstop. The outfielder had caught the ball, turned to throw it home, and just fired it, not realizing that this kid was standing about five feet behind him. So full speed ahead, five feet away, just crushed his face. The ball hit. He just dropped like a rock. Uh, crushed every bone in his cheek, shattered his nose, and uh, took him to the ER. When the ER doc, um, usually when you've broken your nose, you can kind of hear a, like a pop if you try to move it. There was actually no pop. It was just like, like Play-Doh. Um, and they said that because of the swelling, they couldn't operate. They said, we, can't, we, we have to rebuild your face. We've got to put a new cheekbone in. We've got to rebuild your nose. But we can't do that because of all the swelling. So what we need you to do is to come back here and see us every day. And we're going to put some steel rods up your nose to reopen your nasal cavity. Because otherwise, your nasal cavity will be closed off. So he goes home. He packs his face in clay. And in just a couple hours of the clay pack, you can see how much that's already opened the eye up. That's because you're getting new circulation in. When new circulation comes in, it grabs the coagulated blood and pulls it out. So you have a lot of testimonials for bruises. We've got a lot of people that have sent pictures of their grandmothers who have fallen in later years and they've bruised their face and they pack it in clay and it just draws that bruise right out. Well, you can see that that's happened to him. He should have had both of his eyes blackened at this point, but the clay with the new circulation 
Um, did it with a cheesecloth. Actually put a piece of cheesecloth down over each eye and then just packed his whole face in clay like you maybe would at the spa other than it was over the eyes as well. He goes back the next day to the ER for the procedure and the ER doc says, I don't know what you did, but I've never seen swelling go down this fast. We can operate today. You know, nurse clear my schedule. So he went in and, and it, so it didn't rebuild his face overnight. He had to still have the surgery, but he was able to do it the next day rather than waiting two or three or four days with all of that pain and those procedures. And I know this story because that's my little brother. And uh, so the reason I started out the presentation by saying you always should have clay on the property, on the premise, is because there is just so many ways to use clay. Whether it's for facials, bee stings, spider bites. My, my wife called last night, my little boy had a stomach virus or something. He came home from school and he was just very sick to his stomach and he didn't want to eat anything, but he asked my wife for a glass of clay water and then he went to bed. And then this morning, he's just fine again, a rambunctious five-year-old. So we always try to keep clay on the property. And this is the best way to buy it. It's, it's the cheapest way to buy it. Because of convenience, we actually have it in different tubes now. I, this, is the, this is some people think is funny. This is the exact same clay. We call this one facial mud and this one first aid. They're the exact same product. It's just that some teenage guys don't want to put facial mud on their bee sting. And so we put it in two different jars. And it's the exact same stuff. We sell these for about $10 as well. The thing is, this is the exact same. You get $10 for this little tube of mud or $10 for a full quart of mud. Much better ex way to go. But this can be nice for under the seat of the pickup or maybe in the purse when you're out at the park for the day. And then um, for everybody that came today, I've got a little booklet that my dad wrote called We Eat Clay and Wear It Too. It talks about all the ways you can use clay. It talks about some of the stories we told today and it tells you how to mix it up. Feel free to grab one of those. And uh, I sure appreciate your time. Make sure you get your pocket shakers. And I'll turn the time back over to Sue.